Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. Hello and welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow, and I've been a yoga teacher for over 15 years now while raising my three kids who are quickly becoming young adults. Just as an example, my youngest, Sage, who you actually hear giving a shout out to Schedulicity at the top of each episode, just got her G1 license, which here in Canada means that she can drive with an experienced driver for the next year. It's crazy how fast these kids have grown up and I want to give a shout out to them because they are literally the best teachers I've ever had. As a yoga teacher for years, I just kept saying yes to everything from teaching 16 classes a week, managing two yoga studios, to the point of burnout, mentally, physically, and financially. When I finally figured out how to niche down and build a full-time business, studios and teachers started to ask me how they could do the same. While working one-on-one with hundreds of yoga teachers over the years, I have realized that many of us need resources on building a sustainable business that are rooted in the teachings of yoga. And that's why this podcast was born, so that each and every week you can stay connected to the information and inspiration that will support you as you build your own unique yoga business. And one of those aspects is getting things online. This became a topic that we have talked about a lot here on the podcast, and today we have a new insight into how to really bring bigger things online, like yoga teacher training, conferences. And I think that the information is still applicable to getting your yoga classes online while building community for those online offerings. Because we've just celebrated four years of the podcast, I took some time to scroll back through previous episodes and we've listed every episode where we talk about teaching online yoga for you in the show notes. But I just want to call out that way back in episode six, I talked with Rosalind Kemmer about teaching online yoga. And this was really when not a lot of yoga teachers were doing that. I really like to bring you stories of behind the scenes of how other people are taking things online. That's why we've talked with Jenny McGoy, Amanda McKinney, Yael Oppenheim, Bree Johnson, Nikki Nablevi, Dominique Gauthier, and also I've done some solo episodes in there as well. So like I said, if you have a listen to today's episode and then you want to gather more information about teaching online and how to do that in different ways, go have a look at the show notes page. That's at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 209. So yes, many of our yoga teachers are moving their classes online, but also teacher trainings have moved online as well as conferences. We see summits and all kinds of things that bring continuing education to both teachers and students. And like teaching classes online, these big offerings have their own set of challenges. And I'm so excited to be able to share this interview with Jeevana Heyman. Jeevana was on the podcast back in episode 138, where we talked about accessible yoga. But in today's episode, we really get into the details. And I mean, nitty gritty details of how he moved everything online. And we also dig into what it's like to write a book and share that as a yoga offering. 2020 meant that Jeevana needed to move both the Accessible Yoga Conference as well as the Accessible Yoga Training online. He talks about how this transition went, what went well, what didn't, how he managed the tech element of this transition, and most importantly, how he retained the quality of all of the offerings as they moved online. Before we dive in and meet Jeevana, let's hear our hot tip of the week from the team over at Schedulicity. Hey there, Connected Yoga Teachers. This is Emily with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. When you create and market yoga teacher training through Schedulicity, we can help you capture your students' impulse to book. Once you've created your workshop, it's a great idea to enable the payment add-on and choose to collect a deposit, full prepayment, 
or a credit card number at the time of online booking. This way, that money will go into your bank account when a client books, or if they don't show up, you can charge them based on the no-show policy you've created. Knowing that payment is taken care of allows you to put all of your mental energy into helping your students become the next generation of excellent teachers. Thank you so much, Team Schedulicity. Now let's dive in and meet Jeevana Heyman. Jeevana is the founder and director of Accessible Yoga. He specializes in teaching yoga to people with disabilities with an emphasis on community building and social engagement. Over the past 25 years, Jeevana has led countless yoga teacher training programs around the world. He's truly a cheerleader of yoga teachers. I feel this each and every time I talk to Jeevana. I love how every time I learn something new about how to bring yoga to different populations, how to make yoga more accessible on levels I hadn't even thought about before. And you're going to hear that in today's episode. Now, I want to let you know before we get into the interview that this was recorded right before my Christmas holidays. So you're going to hear me mention vacation. I just want to be super clear. I'm a rule follower here in Canada and we were not traveling anywhere. We stayed in, we did four puzzles and we had an outdoor campfire on a very snowy Christmas day here with our two sons that don't live at home just because we were following as many guidelines as possible in terms of physical distancing. I think it's important to note that just because you might be thinking, oh my gosh, did Shannon go away on vacation? And I just want to share with you that, yes, I want to go on vacation. I want to socialize. I want to hang out with people and hug people in every capacity. And I also know that right now I'm doing the work of really looking at how I can care for the community around me with my actions. Alrighty, let's dive in and get to the interview with Jeevana. Welcome everyone to the Connected Yoga Teacher live podcast and welcome Jeevana. I'm so excited that you're here today with us. Hi Shannon, thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I feel like it's kind of a, well, let me be honest about one thing, trying to take vacation means that you have to do all that work before vacation. So I'm feeling a bit like that. What about you? How are you feeling? Um, yeah, I feel a little overwhelmed. I'm, I'm finishing my second book right now and I have just like a couple weeks left before the deadline. So it's, it's, ah, it's kind of intense. This is exciting that you're finishing your second book. Like, I feel like we just talked to you about your other book. Yeah. Well, but it takes kind of a year. It's like the process is quite long, you know? Um, it's like you have a year usually on a contract to write the book and then it takes almost another year to actually release it. So the first book I wrote actually a couple of years ago, right? Um, this one won't come out until next fall. Oh, wow. Yeah. But it's due. And then I have to, yeah, I have to submit the manuscript like in a few weeks and then it takes like at least nine months to edit and print it and all that stuff. Yeah. Do you have any tips for our yoga teachers who are, this is not the interview question today, yes. mm-hmm. who are like trying to write a manual or a book or something of this? Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. I would say um, the best thing to do is to go to publishers' websites and actually look at what they're looking for. You know, they have, uh, like my publisher is Shambhala. If you go to the Shambhala website, they have a, an outline of what a proposal should look like. And it's like very clear guidelines of what they want to know about. And that's a great way to start is actually by putting together a proposal. Sometimes people think you have to go and write a book and then submit it. And that's not how it works, actually. So you you have to put a proposal together, um, which is unfortunately, a lot of it is about marketing, actually, and how you're going to sell the book. Because they they rely on you to sell the book um, these days, at least. Yeah. but, but the proposal process is also a great way to prepare for writing a book. It's, it's like you create the outline, you create um, a sample chapter, um, kind of a mission statement for why this book needs to happen and what else has been written in that area. It's a great process to go through for a writer, actually, to put a proposal together. Um, so that, I, I'd start there, I think. All right. That's amazing. I am so excited that we're going to chat about what it was like to move everything online. That's what we're chatting about today is how you took, I think, a massive conference and 
your online training or and your training, which was not online, took it all online in 2020. First of all, what which one came first? Which one did you move? Uh, the training came first. That was June uh, was the first online training that we offered. And, um, and then the conference was in October. Um, and actually, we offered a second training in September and then the conference. So by the time the conference came around, I kind of knew more about what I was doing. And I should say, like, I have a great team. Like, I actually have two teams working on this stuff. So I can't really take much responsibility um, for any of this. And, and the other thing is I... Um, I, I need to talk about Amber Carnes because Amber, probably she's the one you should be interviewing actually because Amber <laughs> Amber's the person I went to immediately when I thought, oh, I need to move my training online. And um, she was already a trainer. She leads my program in person and has been doing so for a while. And she is just brilliant and like knew about moving things online and um, marketing and online course content and all that. So, so actually what we ended up doing is Amber and I kind of relaunched our whole training as an online training school. Um, and she's now, she's like the co-founder of that school with me. Um, and so we're going to use, actually, we're already using that platform to share trainings from other folks like um, Kelly Palmer has a race and equity training, you know, that was on there. And um, we have some other exciting, oh, and Amber offered her training on there. And we have other ones planned for next year. So it's, it's kind of turned like what I realized was I created this platform for my training. And then I thought, wow, I could share that with other people. That's amazing. Well, I'm glad that you're here today as an, I would love to get Amber on <laughs> yeah. uh, again onto the podcast, but I'm glad you're here because I remember chatting with you and you saying like, Oh my gosh, what, what thing are you using for this Shannon? Like what I appreciate is that you weren't like a tech, genius before you did this and it sounds like you're still going forward with it are you what's right. going to happen let's say covid was completely gone magic wand yeah. time what would you do would you leave some online yeah i mean i i love it i love teaching online i it's not at all what i expected and i i mean i love teaching in person but it's been such a great experience because i mean previously i, I was traveling all the time so I, I was like on the road. I was like one of those teachers that's just like going, I would be gone one to two weeks a month. You know, I was hardly ever with my family and literally like on airplanes and hotels and all that. And it, and it just, it took a toll on me, honestly. Like I've been doing that for about 15 years and um, it's amazing. Like I don't want to complain because that's like, that was my dream. Like I had my dream job, you know, like to get to travel all over and then teach yoga. It was just like incredible. But it was tiring. And um, so now online, I was like, I can just sit here in my little, <laughs> my little office and do the same thing. Like, it's just like a miracle. I was just like, that's incredible. So I'm feeling kind of lucky that I could make the transition and that I can rest. I mean, this time has been great for writing my book and, and for just taking care of my body. It's just not... Being on the road is hard, you know, it's, it's kind of exhausting. Um, my practice is better. I just feel like I get to eat food that I can prepare every day. I don't have to like find some random food in an airport. It's just kind of, um, it's been great for me. I didn't really think about that part of the moving online. I was thinking all about the technology. So I appreciate yeah. that you said like, this is really fitting better. I mean, it's also sort of taking care of the planet a bit more if we're flying around less. Exactly. What about the part of missing people? Yeah. I mean, I definitely miss people. I would say what I miss the most is that at, at the trainings, um, I got to watch people meet each other and, and form bonds and communities where we had programs. So, you know, accessible yoga, we were really into community building. And so like when I would go to, like New York or something, we'd have like a really big New York group meet and they'd get to meet each other and connect. And it formed like a, a local accessible yoga community. And that, I miss that. I miss watching them kind of create that um, together. And also just, of course, interacting with people. And I mean, you know, that's, we all miss that. I mean, that goes without saying, just like being in a room teaching yoga is amazing. And the energy that you get back as a teacher, I, I miss that for sure. It's definitely, it's more tiring to teach online. 
Yeah. So did you end up changing the schedule then when you were teaching online? We, we changed it a little bit, but not that much. Um, a lot of my, my program is, um, you know, it's uh, continuing education really. So it's not like uh, most people that take my training are already yoga teachers. And so I don't worry so much about like, making sure that they're okay. Like I know I trust them and I, and I feel like being online, I think that's the problem with like taking a 200 hour online feels harder for me than what I do. Um, if it was a 200 hour and people who don't really know anything about teaching, I feel like that would be a harder interaction to have, but taking a graduate course online feels a little easier. Um, it's really, my program is really about creativity and exploration and fun. And so a lot of that can happen online. We can watch each other. Actually, I, someone just told me the other day that they found that it was really great because because they're big groups too, and they could scroll through the screen and just watch other people and their different bodies. And you see so many different people practicing at the same time. Um, it's really quite amazing, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So then how do you, like what technology goes into this? Let's say either with the training or the conference, are there similarities or differences with those? and yeah. What do you use to put that all together? Well, we ended up using Kajabi. You know Kajabi? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, Kajabi is a great platform because it's very versatile. It's basically like an online business platform. It's not designed for yoga teaching per se. It's really designed for anyone, I think, who wants to have an online business. And so it creates the structure for your for your website and your marketing um, as well as holding the content and be, and it's a learning management system. So you could have that kind of process where you have the videos stored in a certain way and people can kind of go through step by step and complete the course. So as far as the learning management systems that were out there, it felt like the most flexible. Um, so we use that and then we use zoom. So the course already, I'd had some content online before, um, but it was just in a WordPress site. People would just go and watch videos before they took the course. So we already kind of had that piece and that still stayed the same. And then the online was all on Zoom. Um, and what we had, oh, the other thing about Kajabi is there's a community forum. There's like a message board. So we use that quite a bit so people could communicate with each other. I would say community building is the part, again, that I feel like I miss the most. But um, the other thing we did is we had breakout practice groups outside of the class hours. And I had my, um, I have a team of like mentors of, of trainers all over the world. And so they would lead practice groups in their own area. So we had like European ones and Asia ones going. Um, so those groups could come together. Cause that's the other thing. It's like amazing about being online is that we have international groups all the time. You know, it's like the opposite of the local group. It's like really a wide <laughs> net. Um, Oh, that's fantastic. I love it that you, you have these. So I'm curious around this idea of people having their breakout practice groups. What, what happens? <laughs> I have so many questions because I have a training. Let me just get really real about the selfish reason for this question right now. <laughs> I have a training that I've always done in person. It's 20 hour yoga for pelvic health. And it it needs to be online this year, obviously. It happens in January. And I feel like I'm going to miss out on the things like watching a body right there. Or or if someone's like, oh, I can't make the training, but I'll just grab the recording. I don't know that they're going to do that. And so the accountability and seeing them teach and all of those things, how do you deal with that portion of things? Well, I mean if you use a learning management system, they have to like check off that video, like they've watched it. I mean, that's, you can make that a requirement. The other way we've done it is we actually aren't doing that in Kajabi so much as actually having just a final, there's like a final uh, quiz at the end where they basically attest to having watched the videos. And I, and I actually trust people. So for me, that's enough. Like if someone says I did this, that's like, I, I believe them, you know, like I don't, my job isn't to question people and their, you know, authenticity or whatever. I just believe that, that people will be honest. And, um, and I love that. That's a lot about what I'm trying to do in my program anyway, is trying to give people that like, like share power. 
And I think as a teacher or a leader, it's really easy to fall into a trap of thinking that I have to be on top of everyone. And that's just, I think that's dangerous in yoga, especially, you know, like as the teacher that I'm like in charge and I get to tell people what to do with their bodies. Like I really go against the grain there. I don't believe that's true. I think my, my, I'm like a facilitator and my job is to share the power with the people who are in the room with me and give people agency and authority over their bodies and over their practice. That, that's what my goal is. So I kind of feel the same way about the training. Like I'm, it's a shared experience and it's a shared responsibility. So I believe people that they've done the program. I mean, why else are they, they're going to pay money and come and, you know, it's like, Although we give a lot of it away too, a lot of scholarships, but that's another story. Um, so anyway, but the, the breakout groups are great. There's a few things we used actually. One is that I've asked people if it's okay if they share, spotlight their video during Zoom. So in terms of watching bodies and missing that piece, what I was able to do is I can, I scroll through the screens when we're doing a practice. So I'm, I'm usually leading a practice, um, verbally, but not demonstrating when I'm doing that because I want to watch what they're doing. And I scroll through all the Zoom screens and choose some people to spotlight. And I've already asked for their permission. And basically, as long as you have your video on, you're saying it's okay for me to share that. Um, and they get to see each other's practice and like watch other bodies and see how bodies move, which is great. Um, and then we have breakout groups, like I said, that are by time zone and location. So people can just select I tell them you should go to like one a week or whatever it is, or two a week. And they can select from a schedule of those that are happening in their own time zones. So there's a lot of scheduling and coordinating that goes into that, actually. Um, and then otherwise, a lot of it is just traditional Zoom classes, like either a lecture or with PowerPoint or teaching where I just step back over here and I have like my, yeah, my little setup, you know. Oh, yeah. So I just step back onto the mat. Um, to practice and then come back and talk about it. So it's, there's a lot of that moving back and forth. <laughs> I love this idea of the quiz. I thought you were going to say like they fill out this quiz and then I'll know if they took on in all of the information, but instead the quiz is like, did you complete these things? That's yeah. amazing. That's a, that's a golden, golden tip. I'm going to use that now for sure. Yeah. And also this idea that, you know, people are really showing up for themselves in this. That's great. And the explanation of, of what it's actually like to teach that is also really handy. How do you, because I know accessible yoga talks about props all of the time. And so how do you do that? Like, does everyone have those props? Do you, are you teaching your teachers, make sure you have, you know, even something to hold your phone or something while while you're practicing yeah. or teaching do you have a kind of a checklist for people at home mm -hmm. we do i mean i have a, a, a list of props i ask people to have and if and sometimes alternates so like if you can't go and buy those things you can use household items for some of it like you know if you can't if you don't want to buy a bolster which can be expensive you could use um some bed pillows that are like folded and vertically and then put into a pillowcase and tied like there's or you can take a roll of towels like there's a few things you can use in place of others you know for a strap you could use a belt or um, a rope uh, the belt of a robe so um but I, I definitely want people to have the experience of using props and so I use them when I teach and I encourage people to do that in their practice I think getting comfortable with using props in your own practice really helps when you're sharing them with others, you know, to really feel them on your body is great. And also, I, I think we need to normalize them. I mean, I know with COVID, it's been hard because I think a lot of studios, even before they stopped, when they, when they were doing in-person teaching, or now that some are again, they're not using props because they're worried about people touching the same thing. So that's a, that is a problem that I think we still need to address. Um, but other than that, I would just say that normalizing props is essential for accessibility. We're all using props all the time. Um, a yoga mat is a prop. A wooden floor is a prop. You know, I would say your body is a prop. That's like what I always say is like, your body is a prop. That's the whole point of asana is like working on my relationship to gravity and to nature and to the earth. You know, it's like, this is what we're doing. And asana is like moving things around in relation to other things. 
So this whole idea of props as other is just kind of wrong, I say. Have you added in how to teach online in some of those trainings or, or are you getting questions from teachers like, okay, I'm taking this training, but now how do I teach to people? Yeah, actually, um, Amber actually does a section on that in the training right now. And she also focuses on marketing. So it's a combination of tips for online teaching and tips for marketing uh, yoga classes right now, which again, she's really great at. I think, I think teaching online is challenging, um, especially for newer teachers. Like it's one thing to take existing programs and move them online, but if you're a newer teacher, it can be hard to start online. So I really feel for younger or like newer teachers in that way. But um, I think for teaching online, a lot of, there's there's different ways to go. I'd say um, you need to encourage students to keep their cameras on so you can see what they're doing, you know, to prepare their space, which is what we all can do and make sure they have that space available so that you can see and, and have the camera set up right so you can see them and make sure that they're safe. I mean, mostly it's safety. But I think there's a benefit in it and for the students, which is there's a certain freedom of practicing at home. I mean, sometimes working, uh, practicing in a group class can be inspiring, but it could also be intimidating for a lot of accessible yoga students. So I actually think for our community, um, participating in online classes can actually be really beneficial. Um, you kind of let go of this idea that you're being watched, even though you are probably being watched by the teacher. It's not like being in a room where everyone's staring at you or something. And especially for someone who feels like not confident, that can be really, really helpful. I'm also curious, do you make a yeah. checklist for your teacher trainers or your speakers for the conference? Do they have a checklist of like, here, here's a microphone? Like, how do you do all of the sound and video check with all of these multiple people? Yeah. Well, the conference was more challenging in that way because we had, I think, close to like over 50 presenters over the course of a weekend. Wow. Some of it was pre-recorded, which helped a lot. So they would say about um, maybe just less than half was pre-recorded. So we had to actually hire a tech person um, who would come in at the beginning of the call and check out everyone's setup and make sure that they had it right. Um, although by this point, I think most people are used to teaching online. So it's not like it used to be. Like most yoga teachers kind of get it. They know what they're doing. We did have some sound problems though, for sure. Um, I'd say the biggest, that's the biggest issue I see with yoga classes online is the quality of the sound. And I see teachers using a mic on their computer and then going back um, to their mat and expecting the sound to carry. And it's very low quality if you can hear them at all. So I would say like investing in a good mic. Like I have, I don't know if you can see my mic here. Connected yoga teachers, I'm popping in here for a moment. If you want to see the mic that Jeevana showed us in the live video, We'll link to that in the show notes. It's a Samsung lavalier mic that he said was about a hundred US dollars. Yeah, it's a great mic, and it, again, it wasn't it wasn't the most expensive one. You know, it was okay. Actually, um, it was a sound engineer that recommended it to me because I was really looking for the right the right piece of equipment. But I would just say, teaching online that's I think the biggest thing. So some of the um, some of the challenges we had at the conference was the sound quality of the teachers wasn't always great, especially when they're back on their mats. That's what I saw. When people are up and by their computer, usually it's okay. But then when you move away, it just loses that. So that's that's a big thing to watch out for. Um, also, I think, yeah, the challenge was, one of our biggest challenges was accessibility, really, about, you know, being online is more accessible generally. But all of it was done in English. And so I feel like that's where we really missed the mark. And I think it's just because of the time. We didn't have enough time to look at translating the material into other languages, um, having ASL translation. What we did is have captioning um, for all the programs. And I think captioning is um, an incredibly important tool for online teaching. You can get um, a program called otter.ai, so it's O-T-T-E-R dot A-I. Um, that's automatic captioning. Live captioning integrates with Zoom. 
And what happens is you would click on the link at the top of the page and it opens in another browser window and you see the captions live. And then when you put the recording into the whatever platform you're using, like what we did is we would have to take the Zoom recordings, put them onto Vimeo and integrate the Otter captions. And then they come in as captions right in the screen and then put that recording into Kajabi. So there's really a long process of archiving every um, every live session in the training or in the conference. That takes a lot of staff time. Wow. Would it ever, do you go through those captions then and make sure, because a lot of the time it'll change words that it doesn't know, especially yoga well, words. Uh, that's the great thing about Otter actually is that it has a dictionary that you can build. So ahead of time, we put in tons of Sanskrit words and yoga words and people's names. And so those would be correct. But I did go through a few of them where I could tell there were big errors. And that takes hours, though. It takes hours to read through a transcript for like an hour-long workshop. I mean, to correct that is very, very time-consuming. I think people generally know that the caption quality will be questionable. You can also get live captioners, but they're quite expensive. And um, the other company is Rev.com that everyone's using. But I would say the problem with Rev is that you can't put in this um, words that you'll use frequently. Like Otter does that and Rev doesn't do it. And I think that to me that I've tried them both and the quality of Rev captioning um, usually isn't as good live. What Rev does really well is post uh, production captioning really well. So if you're gonna, if you wanna caption something later, <laughs> again, you could use Otter for that, but Rev is actually generally even better they do higher quality. They have someone who goes through, but they there is controversy around that company because they pay their captioners poorly. So it's it's complicated. All, all these things are quite complicated. But I would say captions are great for for live content. It helps people to who don't have English as their first language or have difficulty hearing, <clears throat> or for the deaf community. And also for videos that you put up online. I mean, that's how I know I watch a lot of videos that way by reading captions, even though I can hear. So um, I think it's just a great way to engage with people. Well, I love that you're bringing the accessibility in, even when you're like, okay, there's this brand new thing that we're going to do. And how can we make it accessible? I know Amber's great at that when she posts an Instagram image and she will write out the, the explanation of that image. Right. And I think, oh, what a great idea. We should all be doing that. We should all be doing that. There's actually um, two ways to do that. So you're talking about, um, you know, captioning still images on Instagram or Facebook, and that's an essential piece of accessibility. I mean, that's a, it's something we do in accessible yoga all the time, but there's some, there's a, there's a two ways to do it. One is as alt text in, in Instagram, which means that it won't show up, um, directly. You may not see it in the caption. It's You have to click on something or you have a screen reader, uh, which is a special device that people who are um, deaf or hard of hearing would use that would, um, or visually impaired, I'm sorry, visually impaired would use who can't see the, the image, they would use that to read it to them. Right. This is uh, something that I don't think is talked about enough in social media marketing. So. No, it's it's really horrible. So I would say we should, whenever you post an image, and, and especially if the image has words in it, because you have to realize that when you have an image, like if you put a quote in the image, an Instagram, a screen reader can't actually see that as, as words. Um, the technology isn't there. The technology is there to actually describe an image sometimes of like, this is a person or this is a dog but um, it can't decipher the letters inside of a image. It can only do that when it's text. Right. Okay. Yes, so it makes it. total sense. And I'm thinking now even about our, like how many images I put up, even for this yeah. call today of like, it's just a visual image and it doesn't say, I mean, we right. do put a description we as well. Description. Well, that's fine. So as long as you have the description in the caption or whatever you've written, that's the same. That's fine. That's the point. As long as that right. same information is available in the caption or the text that is alongside that image, that's that's what you need to do. Yeah. This is why I caption my stories on Instagram. And sometimes I think, oh, 
I don't want to do this, but I try and summarize. I mean, I don't do it word for word, but it is actually handy for me to like summarize what my thoughts actually were. So this yeah. is, this is good. Um, That's great that you do that. Yeah. Anything else that you think, oh gosh, if I would have known this at the beginning of putting all of this online, this would have really saved me some headaches or some time, or I would tell anyone this bit before they put something online. Hmm. I have to think about that. I mean, I, I guess, actually, I think I should have gone online before is what I thought. Like, how amazing is it? It's in terms of accessibility, it's reaching more people who couldn't come to my in-person programs. And also because of the expense of travel or staying in a hotel, you know, people would sometimes come to where I was teaching and join me, which I appreciate, but I know that's incredibly expensive. And now that expense is gone. There's just the expense of the program and people can participate as they want. So our programs, everything is recorded and people have access for a year. So it's like, to me, it, it means it's more accessible for people's busy lives or because they have, someone has a disability and they can only be on the screen for 10 minutes at a time. They don't want to watch an hour long lecture. That's fine. Like they can just watch it over months and a year. And that feels a lot more aligned with our work. So I just wish we had done it earlier. Um, and our conference as well, like it was so great to bring people together from all over the world who share common interests. And one of the things that I found so amazing, we had community um, networking sessions. We had people come together around topics like yoga for incarcerated populations, yoga for larger bodies. And we'd have like 30 or 60 people on that call. And then everyone would share about their work. And that was totally inspiring. So I've been trying to think of community building techniques online do you know what i mean rather than just education but how do you engage people and connect them with each other because one of the things that we're really lacking is that net the networking that would happen in person you know like if you go to an event if you go to a training or a conference half of the reason you go is you get to meet other people doing that work and you find your yoga or your whatever your, your community there and so our for the nonprofit next year we're planning these monthly um we're calling them community forums on these topics. And each one will be an opportunity to have a little bit of education, but then most of the time would be spent with this kind of sharing in, you know, in a Zoom call, actually. So, oh, that's amazing. That. I love anything that has to do with building community and building that network. I know, you're so good at that. Well, I thrive on it. That's why I like it's like my oxygen, which makes now difficult, but yeah. You have conversations like this, you know, going to the accessible yoga conference. I went to the one in Toronto when it was in person. Yeah. Um, and the attention to detail that you put into that of like, here is how to get around when you get there. Here's how to take different transportation and Toronto mm. as it's a great city in many ways. <laughs> it has a great diversity, um, a great culture, a great vibe, but it is not very wheelchair accessible. And it's been criticized for that before. Um, and so th there were so many barriers. I mean, I'm fine to go to the city, but it still is like a three hour drive. And like you said, it's the travel and the stay and it's something new. And, and so it really does make it more accessible to be able to do that online. Although not always, because I know some people can't, you know, digital access is an issue too that we should mention. I mean, I, I, I can't talk about accessibility without saying that. If people don't have access to the internet or a computer or the time to be online, I mean, that's definitely keeping people away. So I feel like that's the next step in accessibility for us all to look at. Um, but also just say a, a term that I think is really helpful in terms of what you described is universal design, which is about looking at all the aspects of someone's life and how, how the world can accommodate us all rather than expecting a person with a disability to accommodate or change and adapt to the situation. It's about adapting to everyone and making something universally available. And I would say as yoga teachers, we really need to focus more on that in terms of um, giving people information. So clear information is the first step in accessibility, um, telling people what, what it is, how it's going to work, um, how they will do it. Like all that information is important. Like if, if you come to a yoga class, you should know the marketing should have been clear enough that you know exactly what the content of that, of that class will be, 
right? That's an accessibility issue. And it's trauma-informed to know ahead of time, what am I going to expect? Because I think fear and intimidation keeps a lot of people away from yoga, from yoga conferences, from yoga trainings, not knowing what's going to happen and thinking that they're going to be singled out or not as good as other people. Or, and, and then it, it's so, uh, it can be just so intimidating. So I think giving people information is the most important thing we can do to make the world more accessible. And then to look at the systems that we've had, that we have set up and see how can we adapt those systems to people, you know, as the organizer, that's our job. Well, I, I have to say that I really felt this <laughs> at your conference. Like every single detail was about that. Even, even things I hadn't even considered, you know, at the time I remember someone was like, make sure you put your pronouns on your name tag. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh -huh. And now, now it just seems like a normal thing. So thank you for that attention to detail. Okay. Speaking of accessible, I want to ask a question that my mom told me to ask because oh, she's okay. a fellow yoga teacher. She said, what about when you have a yoga student who is doing a lot of sitting in a chair and isn't able to get down onto the floor and they're at home? What about like, do you have any tips about, you know, how to maybe use different props? Like maybe, I don't know, do you use the bed or how, how can you um, sort of bring the floor to the person? Does it always involve a chair? Mm. I would say thank you for that question, mom. She might want to take my training. <laughs> That's what I told her earlier today. <laughs> I'm popping in here again, Connected Yoga Teachers, to give you an update. My mom actually did take the training after she heard this interview with Jeevana and I because we did it live. And she signed up for a quick online training. And I want to tell you that she has finished it now. She absolutely loved it and was talking to me each and every day about how the training was going and what she was learning. And I was so impressed with the depth of this training, we had some great conversations about accessibility, social justice, and so much more. And at the end of the training, she said to me, I'm a bit sad that it's over now. So I really feel like Jivana did the work of, you know, creating this community where yoga teachers feel really held and where the learning is really rich so I will make sure to include a link in the show notes to the next training, which if you're listening in live time here is happening May 10th to the 24th, 2021. Also, just so you know, this is an affiliate link. We are only affiliates for things that we're really excited to share with you. Things that we know, love, and trust. That's what we do. Like that's a lot of it. And also... Or if she wants a shorter training, I actually just did a training with Yoga Journal, which was a really interesting experience, a Chair Yoga 101. But in terms of that question, I think uh, uh, the bed or a couch are the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, you know, when I would do in-person um, privates with people in their homes doing chair yoga, I realized there's an opportunity to not just stay seated in the chair by transferring to a bed or a couch. Often couches are a little more um, a little less intimate than a bed. So like I would be working with someone in the living room and they could actually be sitting on the couch or sitting on a chair and then transfer to the couch for Shavasana or for some, some recline practice. It is really, I, I would say that um, chair yoga is amazing. And I, it's like my favorite thing. I could talk about it forever and all the benefits of chair yoga, but it's really great to get the body to move in different ways. And being reclined is special and, and more relaxing. So for certain practices, there's benefit in that. You can get an inversion, an easier, more gentle inversion, I would say, in reclined, like lying on a bed or a couch. Um, you can rest in Shavasana easier than in a chair, which can be challenging. Bed yoga is amazing. I mean, bed yoga is like a whole thing. I have I have classes up somewhere on bed yoga, but I do cover it in the training. Um, I think bed yoga is also an area that hasn't been explored enough in the yoga world, like the benefits of that. I would just say my, my only precaution with bed yoga is, well, other than that you might fall asleep, um, <laughs> is that you really have to watch that um, 
the, the mattress is very soft. And, and, you know, we take for granted, at least most yoga teachers take for granted the hardwood floor, which I, which I mentioned is a prop. And I'm serious when I say that the floor is a prop, because if you practice on a bed, it's a very different experience than practicing on a hardwood floor. It's like practicing on a beach. If you've ever done that, it's totally different, you know, or in the grass. It's totally different than on a mat on a hardwood floor because you don't have that resistance. Like there's that resistance that the mat gives and the, um, the kind of traction that can be lost on a bed. You can really sink into the bed. And I think you really have to watch the position of your spine. There's some poses I think are not very safe to do in bed, like a headstand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, like lots of things. Um, <laughs> This is yeah. really helpful. I, you know, the other thing is that everyone doing yoga at home now has a couch. Yeah. It's like no one would have a couch or a bed in their yoga class. Like, don't forget to bring your couch <laughs> to class. <laughs> and that's yeah. what we do in the training. We do. I have people get on their bed or their couch and lead them through a practice and have them explore that in their own body. And then they can use that for their teaching as well. I mean, even like, even if we move past COVID where we're in person, like I said, I, I've done lots of privates where I work with people in that way. Um, people who are doing chair yoga, older people or people with disabilities who really need someone to come to them. Uh, I've taught in hospitals as well where people are in beds. It's just, it's a great tool. And I would say that even if you're not going to do that work, bed yoga is a great tool for yourself, just your own self-care, not just because you get to do yoga in bed, but because the other thing that bed does is it you take the, it changes the, the direction of practice. So most things that you would do standing, you do lying down. And it's a great way to really rethink asana and our relationship to gravity. Um, and that's what we're doing in the, in the training a lot. A lot of what I do is I take a practice. We break it down into like, why? Why do we do it? What are the benefits of the pose? Um, and then can you find that benefit in this other direction? So like, say... Could you find the, the balance of tree pose when you're lying in bed? And so then I, ha I give this people in the program a challenge to do that. How can you work on balance when you're lying in bed? And there are things you can do, actually. But you really have to think. <laughs> you have to use your thinking to, to consider that. And sometimes you have to bring in balance. Same like in chair yoga, you know, like, you have to bring in strength, you have to bring in balance, you have to bring in um, hip extension, certain things that are lost when you're seated a lot. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I'm going to try tree. Uh, I did a lot of yoga in my bed when I couldn't get out of my bed when I first had a herniated disc this summer. Right. And um, it was really, it really challenged me to think, how can I do small movement or meditation or my breath practice? And, but and it's not just tree, like try tree. But what I'm saying is what we default to is a shape. Yeah. Right? And that's fine. That's okay. But I'm saying yoga is more than the shape. So the, the experience of tree is more than getting my body into the certain shape. The, the experience of tree has to do with like a lot of things. There's grounding, strengthening, balance. Those, those three elements in particular um, come to mind when I think of tree pose. And so when I'm teaching tree to someone in bed, I'm going to emphasize one of those elements and really think, okay, how can we work on grounding in this tree pose that we're doing right now in bed? Or how can I focus on balance? So what I'm saying is you pull apart the, the benefit um, and you can really bring that back. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to try it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to know what happens. I know. Take a picture. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is so good. I also want to ask you, um, well, if anyone wants to follow along a little bit more, I want to put up your accessible yoga and like, these are the Instagram handles, accessible yoga and at accessible yoga training, but you also have a Facebook group as well. Yes. Just like you. I'm like, I, I we're, <laughs> we're Facebook twins. Um, yeah, we have the accessible yoga community. That's the main Facebook group. And then we have, actually we have 25 other groups actually that are different, 10 different language groups and regional groups. They're not as active. Some of them are though. Some of the, re the language groups are active and um, it's really fun if you speak another language or if you're from a different country, 
you can find those just by searching for like accessible yoga espanol or in greek or dutch or um whatever you know whatever language you speak um but the main one is the accessible yoga community where um i basically try to copy whatever you're doing <laughs> this is so bad <laughs> This is not true. It's I, challenging. I'm, for a while, I, for a while, I wanted to like merge with you and just be like Shannon, just like help. Yeah. <laughs> I want to. Well, I want to ask. Like, do you manage twenty five other groups? Like, it's a lot to manage one. I mean, we have um, moderators or volunteers, amazing people who moderate them, and we're kind of reorganizing, trying to get them more staff support. But the main group, um, Sarah Nutridge is the main moderator for our um, accessible yoga community group, which is a huge job. Also, Sherry Hotchkiss uh, is moderating that. And then, and I'm on there a lot too, but it's a, it's, it is a lot, especially in the beginning of COVID. <laughs> and like in March or something, we had something like, I don't know, 100, like it was like, a thousand people a month were joining. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. And now it's like back to like a hundred a month. It was literally a thousand a month. And now it's down to like a hundred a month. And we were having like t dozens and dozens of posts a day. And um, actually we don't pre-approve posts. We try to keep it open. Oh, this is something we shut down. We're at over 10,000 members now. We're like, we really have to keep it pre-approved because we have people wanting to sell our yoga teachers all kinds of things. Yeah, we need to do that, I think. We actually have just under 10,000, but it's still, I we keep it open and we just take things away. But I don't know. I'm, I'm almost ready to shift to that because it just feels exhausting. Just uh, let your audience know. One, one person reached out and they're like, did I do something wrong? All of a sudden my post has to be pre-approved. I was like, oh my gosh, we should have put more notifications yeah. up. But not at all. It really is like, it creates a safer space as well. We found, especially like there were some questions coming in and especially around your election in the U S that would just trigger. Like there was a question that came in about essential oils in a yoga class and it blew up and we, we couldn't see it coming, but we can see it a little bit more now. So we'll even message people and say, you know what, this, this is one of those questions that might really flare people up and you might want to word it this way. Mm -hmm. And they love that. They're like, thank you so much for the heads up because they don't want to offend right. people or, um, yeah. Okay. So well, you're convincing me. Well, here's another thing, a little Facebook thing that I haven't figured out and I have to figure out by the end of the week, our team is thinking about taking, or I want to gift our team of two weeks of vacation from moderating the Facebook group. And someone said, I think you have to archive it. Otherwise people would be able to comment and people would still be able to go in and see, but it would give everyone a two week mm. vacation. Can you rotate the break, the vacations? We do that now during yeah. the week because it's become so much, but that's a good question as well. Two oh, weeks no. of paid vacation is what I want them to have paid oh. and not having no, to you're, and you're, you do things right. So <laughs> <laughs> not always, not always. Gina. There's a lot of things we could work on here. Okay. So I also want to ask you about your book, hmm. your new book. What's, what's it about? Well, uh, it's about, um, it's really yoga philosophy and the yoga teachings and how we can apply them right now, especially in um, the context of social justice and equity and accessibility. So really the, the focus of the book is, a, I mean, it's quite personal actually, but it's kind of like my approach to the teachings um, as a practitioner, not an academic, but how I understand these teachings. And I mean, really like the Bhagavad Gita and the Yoga Sutras in particular, and how these can apply now in our lives, you know, in a very different time than when they were written, um, even though they're, and they're universal. And also how the teachings can really make us to be more compassionate and um, that the goal of yoga is to be, of service in the world, you know, and it feels like we've missed that. Like it feels like there's some, there's some like disconnect to me between the teachings and the way I see people practicing right now. Does that make sense? Yes. I, when can we order the book? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, um, probably in the spring, it might be available for pre-order. Um, but 
Yeah, I think it'll be out in October. I hope it'll be. If I <laughs> it's hard, you know, it's hard. It's like, um, you know, writing is is a great practice for me. I, I'm not really a writer, but I mean, it's like I'm a yoga, I'm a yogi, and for me, it's just like here's another way I can work with my mind. And it, a lot of it is like, when do you criticize yourself? Like, when do you edit yourself, and when do you not? And like to really find that balance where. Um, you know, I think any writer knows that. Any, it's like an artist too. It's like, when do you stop painting? You know, it's like it's hard to just like keep going. <laughs> when do you pull back? When do you, you know, and how hard to make a point? How clear? How much to um, expand on something? And how much to share? You know, I think that it's always a challenge. So, um, but I'm excited because it's really what I'm most passionate about. I mean, I love. It, it's just an. Ex, it's really an expansion on. Um, my first book on accessible yoga. I don't know if you read it, but there's a section. Right <laughs> yeah, there's a section on philosophy and applying the teachings in our life. This is just more of that, basically. Right. So. I remember talking to you about that book, and you're like, "Actually, I've got another book coming." And I thought, <laughs> "Oh my gosh!" So it's funny that you say, "I'm not really a writer." With like your second book almost yeah. finished, but it's yoga. It's not. You know, it's not like I'm a professional writer. Like. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I wasn't trained as a writer. I'm just, you know what I mean? I'm a yoga teacher. That's all. That's what I've been trained in and been doing for, I don't even know, 20 years, more. How long now? 25 years, actually, I've been teaching. So I don't, I'm just saying like the writing is just an, another format for my teaching, just like being online or being in person and, and teaching a yoga class or giving a lecture or whatever. It's just another way to share. Um, which is a, you know, a hard work, challenging one for me, but, um, but the book, I mean, accessible yoga is mostly asana. It's mostly about practice. That was easy, you know? Right. Oh, I can't wait to read it. So you let, I need to get us off this interview so that you can get back to your writing today. Thank you so much true. for all of this. I mean, I would highly encourage our connected yoga teachers to go and check out your conference and your training. If they haven't before, anyone can join your Facebook group as well. Um, your, your one main large Facebook group or these, or these smaller ones. That's, that's amazing. I'll put it up again here, accessible yoga training.com. Are there any other websites or places that people can yeah, connect? So, so it's really two different things. AccessibleYogaTraining.com is where they can find out about the training. And then AccessibleYoga.org is for the conference and the ambassador program. So we have a, the ambassador program is our membership program. So people can, you know, have access to a private Facebook group and, um, and mentoring and basically represent accessible yoga in the world. Um, and there's also my personal, like, Jeevana Heyman, you can go to my website, and also at Jeevana Heyman for on Instagram. Yeah. And you also have there. a podcast. And I have a podcast. Yeah, Amber and I together we have the Accessible Yoga Podcast. That's been amazing. Um, that's been really fun. I really recommend people go and listen. I, I We've had the best conversations. We just did a series on making asana accessible that – the last one in particular actually is about chair yoga and I thought it was really a great conversation and brought a lot of these issues together, a lot of issues around contemporary yoga practice and how chair yoga, I think, is really an antidote to it. Um, hopefully you all will listen. So. Yeah, I was just thinking there's a there's a question in our Connected Yoga Teacher group about chair yoga and that'd be a great place to to um, to post yeah. that episode as well. Well, thank you so much for all of the work that you do and really making yoga accessible to all of us, like all people walking the earth. I, I love that this is your work. It really shines through. And I love mm. chatting with you. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to when we can meet in person again, for sure. But this this is the next best thing. Yes, yeah, so you can visit me in California again. Yeah, that'll uh, be nice. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks for all of your work, too. I mean, I just have to say, like, I... I I just copy you. I see you doing all these amazing things. And I like try to learn, like, what is Shana doing? Um, and you're, it's inspiring, really. It's, it's beautiful. The way you build community is quite incredible. So I appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much for, you know, supporting Accessible Yoga and my work and having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Jivana, for all of your time and wisdom in this episode. 
You are so sweet to say that you're just copying me. I decided in the interview, okay, I'm going to accept this compliment instead of fighting with you. (laughs) But I want to clarify for all of our listeners that I have really been following the work that Jivana and all of the accessible yoga teachers and community are doing. It inspires me all the time to see how we can bring yoga to populations who maybe didn't have the same access to yoga and how we can create this community that feels so safe and inviting. And this is what the world really needs. I'm excited about it. I'm just really excited, Connected Yoga Teachers, that you also got to learn along with me as I spoke with Jivana today. And I would say, if you are interested in learning further, make sure to check out Jivana's website and go sign up for maybe the Accessible Yoga Conference or the training. I also wanted to share a key takeaway of mine, which I've already implemented, actually, I did the 20 hour yoga for pelvic health training and I used this idea around doing breakout rooms and also this self-led accountability in terms of certification. So I was so glad to get those two nuggets from Jivana. And if you're wondering, the other amazing thing is that the replay is available for this 20 hour training and you can access it any time and go through it at your own pace. This was never possible before. We'd always done it in person. And so I just want to echo what Jivana said, that there are some huge bonuses to teaching online. I would love to hear from you, Connected Yoga Teachers. And there are a few places where we can continue this conversation about what it's like to take yoga teacher trainings online or conferences online what you might take away from today's episode and use in your own business, you can share about that in the Connected Yoga Teacher Facebook group. I'll make sure that we link to that in the show notes. Or at the very bottom of the show notes page, there's a place where you can share a comment. I also have some exciting news. I am going to be offering a pelvic girdle pain workshop. So for those yoga students who are dealing with any quote unquote, hip pain, that sciatic pain, SI joint pain, any pain that happens in the pelvis, we're really going to dig into that in this two hour workshop. It's happening April the 7th from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I think what I'm most excited about, the workshop is $47, but it makes way more sense to join the Pelvic Health Professionals Membership which is 39 US dollars per month. So you get a full month's access to pelvic health professionals, all of the information in there, as well as this workshop. So if you're like me and you like to get a really good deal and you're frugal with your time and your energy and your money, um, (laughs) because that's the way I am, that's really the best value is to join pelvic health professionals. To learn more, go to pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Huge shout out of thank you to our entire team here at The Connected Yoga Teacher for making today's episode possible. And also thank you, dear listener, for taking the time to be here and hang out. It means so much. And before I sign off, I want to ask you, what might you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, your yoga practice and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up.